Welcome back to the second part of this video. So here's a question. What is missing if the Bible stopped at Genesis 2? Now why is Genesis 1 and 2 so critical as a foundation to the rest of the Bible? Because it describes what the rest of the Bible is getting back to. Not until Revelation 21 is this fellowship restored with God's perfect people again in God's place under God's rule. And so if you were to study Genesis 1 and 2, you would see God's perfect plan for gender, for marriage, for work, for physical creation, for government, for our relationship with God and with each other. We've seen all that is revealed about God and about ourselves in these first two chapters, but notice how much is missing. If Genesis 1 and 2 were all there was, we would never know about God's commitment to justice, His patience, His holiness, or the glory of His mercy. Why did God let sin enter the world? I don't know. But I do know that the perfection of His character is displayed more clearly because of His plan of redemption that rescued us from sin. God has given glory in creation, but so much more in redemption. And that takes us to chapter 3. So let's look at Genesis 3, 1-24, through the fall, a summary. But mankind's first parents chose to set themselves up as equals with God, disobeying Him and incurring the just wrath of God. While expelled from that pristine fellowship with God, they do not receive the complete wrath they deserve. For God has already begun a plan to overturn the curse of sin by placing enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Well, let's look at verses 1-5. through five. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will, shall not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What a lie. Remember the verses we just read? The prohibition in Genesis 2, 15 through 17? The serpent, of course, is the devil. See Revelation 12, 9, for example. And he would have us think, I am like God. I know what is good and what is evil, what's worthy and unworthy of worship, what's weighty and of great consequence, and what's not. It's arrogant, it's idolatrous, it's insane. But sin didn't work. Both Adam and Eve fall for this lie, and immediately in verses 7 and 8, they are not behaving like gods, but like people ashamed of what they've done. They now hide from each other in verse 7, and they hide from God in verse 8. The death that was promised as a consequence in 2.17 has begun. Genesis 3, 1 through 24, the fall and the immediate plan of redemption. So how does God deal with these rebels? All of them, the serpent, Eve, and Adam, fall under God's curse. But there is grace. Adam and Eve are not destroyed on the spot, and he gives hope for redemption. Look at verses 14 and 15, God's word to the serpent. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. God says that he is putting enmity, that is hostility, to the point of killing each other between two parties. Here they are. Three levels of enmity. Between the serpent and the woman, between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed, and between the one seed of the woman and the serpent. The first, it says, is enmity between the devil and the woman. What does that mean? Well, it means that Satan and the human race are enemies. It may not sound like such a great plan of redemption to us if the first thing God does is make us enemies to Satan, but consider the alternative. The alternative would be to be friends with Satan and therefore permanent enemies of God. So God is saying that humanity still belongs to Him. Satan cannot steal us his image-bearing creatures. They still belong to God. Enmity with God's enemy is a good thing. The second level of enmity is it it says is where? God says it's between the woman's offspring, literally seed, and the serpent's offspring, or seed. A pronouncement that humanity will be divided into two camps. One is called the seed of the woman, and that the other one is called the seed of the serpent. Of course, everyone will physically be descendants of the woman, Eve, since she is the first mother of everyone. Nonetheless, some of those physical offspring of Eve will spiritually be the seed of the serpent. That means they will, like Satan, not obey God, but will throughout their lives fall for the deceits of the devil. Think of 1 John 3, 8. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The next verse, 1 John 3, 9, contrasts this group with those who are born of God, who have his seed in them. Others, though, will seek God. And this verse is saying that these two groups are irreconcilable. Now the third level of enmity is the most crucial. 
Look again at verse 15. It ends by saying, He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Suddenly, God is not talking about a group of people, a line of descendants. Instead, He is speaking about one descendant who will deliver the fatal blow to the devil and end the enmity. Do you see that there? He is using a single pronoun, he and him. Out of the woman's seed will arise one man who will crush the head of Satan, thereby ridding the creation of the deceiver that initiated the whole mess. However, this one will not come out of battle unscathed. His heel will be struck. Who is this? Jesus, of course. So that moves us on to Genesis 4 and 5, Cain, Abel, and the wages of sin. As generations continue, the sin resident in the hearts of mankind goes from bad to worse. Yet the seed of the woman continues. Well, the rest of the Bible is basically the outworking of Genesis 3.15. The three levels of enmity being played out in history. Satan is always trying to destroy God's image bearer. And more specifically, he is using his own spiritual seed to corrupt or destroy the godly descendants of Eve. In the very next chapter, we see Cain killing Abel. Has the serpent won? Is the godly line ended? No, in verses 25 and 26, Adam and Eve have another son to carry forward the line that will Sunday birth the Savior. But as the story continues, we are again and again brought to wonder. Will Satan win at snuffing out the line? Or will the promises of God be fulfilled? Consider the flood. Was Satan able to corrupt humanity so badly that God would destroy them all? No, by His grace He delivered one family. Will the promises to Abraham, through whom the seed will come, fall to the ground because his wife is barren? No, God will miraculously provide a son. Will the descendants of Abraham be snuffed out by a famine? No, God will send a savior ahead of them to Egypt and their brother Joseph, and so forth. Finally, it looks as though the devil has won when Jesus is dying on the cross. But that's actually Christ's victory, not his defeat. For there he defeated sin. Well, that moves us on to Genesis 5, where we see the refrain, And he died, and he died, and he died. As we move on to our next section in chapter 5, which lists out the godly line from Adam through Seth, we see this theme continue. It's a record of God's faithfulness to His promises, but death lingers as part of the curse. The phrases all end with the same phrase, and then He died, and then He died. A constant drumbeat, reminding us of the dreadful certainty of what awaits sinners in this world, even those who are of the seed of the woman, and mean to be obedient to God. They are still sinners. Well, let's move on to Genesis 6, 1 through 19, 17, the flood. And even partial judgment of the world does not end the world of sin. In chapter 6, we see more of mankind's descent into depravity and evil. And in verse 7, God announces His judgment, essentially reversing the creative acts of chapters 1 and 2, the flood, where we see wrath, uncreation. This judgment is meant to be understood as an uncreating of the universe can be seen most clearly in chapter 7. Look at verses 11 and 12. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, we read about how God separated the waters below from the waters above, that is to say, in the clouds and the atmosphere. Then in verses 9 and 10, about how He separated the waters of the sea to make room for dry land. Well, now in this flood account, the sea is bursting forth to swallow up the land, and the skies are dumping out all the rain. But then we see grace, recreation. But again, God's wrath is mixed with mercy. For He will not fail to deliver His promised seed. In the midst of God's wrath, through the ark, God has Himself provided a way of escape. And that leads to a recreation. Look at Genesis 8:17. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Again, the language here is plucked right out of Genesis 1 and 2. God is starting over again. The old promises of Genesis 3.15 still intact. Okay, so man has become exceedingly sinful and God has to judge him for it. Yet all the while, God has still had grace on mankind, and He's still faithful to His promises. But why did we need to go through all that detail about judgment taking on the form of uncreation and grace taking on the form of recreation? Well, I want to introduce you to something called typology. Typology is this. God in His providence has done things in the Old Testament, caused events, created institutions, used people that are types of things that He will do in the future. Generally, things about Jesus. God has carried out His plan of redemption forward in the Old Testament in such a way as to get us ready for Christ. So the flood narrative in Genesis, the uncreating and the recreating, is a picture of a future cataclysmic undoing and redoing of the universe. Not by water this time, but by fire. The flood was a real historical event. 
but the next time will be far more terrible judgment, and the re recreation will be a return to paradise. Because at the second coming of Christ, sin will be eradicated for good. Turn to 2 Peter 3 for a moment. Look at verses 5 through 7 and verses 11 through 13. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to His promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Noah's flood is both historical event and a picture of a greater judgment and recreation at the end of time. It is a type of judgment prefiguring the final judgment, thus the language of typology. As we move through the scriptures, we will see many other Old Testament events institutions and persons prefiguring Christ's work like this. Well, let's move on to Genesis 10 and 11, humanity after the flood. And so rebellion against God continues. But though creation is remade, the problem of sin remains. And so first Noah and then the entire human race show their sin as we move into chapters 10 and 11. In chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, humanity wants a name for themselves. But weren't they supposed to be about the business of promoting God's name and His glory and not their own? And furthermore, they don't want to be scattered over all the earth. But weren't they commanded to multiply and fill the earth by spreading out? Once again, we see mankind ignoring God's right to rule and foolishly determining their own agenda in the world. Well, as expected, God will not allow such mutiny. Their plans are halted, and the nations are created who will not come together again until this part of the curse is reversed when Jesus inaugurates the multi-ethnic church. Well, that moves us on to the conclusion. And that takes us through the first 11 chapters. So let's go back to my earlier question. What would we lose if God had simply started the Bible with Genesis 12 when God's story of redemption begins with Abram? Chapters 1 and 2 reveal God's perfect design, the reality of our past and future, and our guide for the present. Chapters 3 through 11 show the nature of our sin. Not again until Romans 1 will we see again in the Bible such a plain depiction of the absolute and wholehearted rebellion of mankind against its Creator. What we are seeing here in these crucial chapters of Genesis is what happens when sinful man intersects with the Holy God. There is just consequences for sinners' actions, but there is also a patient and gracious response from a loving God. Redemptive history has begun. God has set out on His course to redeem fallen humanity and the corrupted universe. He is out to restore the pristine environment and the perfect peace, love, and fellowship that existed in the original creation. To do this, He will deal with their sin and conquer death through keeping the promise which he had made to the woman that one of her descendants will triumph over the enmity of Satan. That's where we're going to be going as we continue through the Bible. And you'll see an outline on your handout that I hope you will find useful your own study. You may want to pause here if you don't have a study guide. Well, that's all for this session. And our next session, we'll be looking at Promised Kingdom of God, Genesis 12 through 50. Thanks for joining us for UC University Old Testament Overview. Stay safe. See you later. See you soon.